Good evening. I'm Sebastian Brack from the Kofi Annan Foundation, and we're here to talk about the double threat to European democracy. The entire world is in the midst of what Larry Diamond has called the democratic recession. In other words, while elections have kept on happening, the quality of those elections has deemed, is deemed to have declined. There's an erosion of democratic norms and values, an erosion of the quality of elections around the world. According to the VDEM Institute at the University of Gothenburg, 89 countries have slid further backwards during the pandemic. In other words, the pandemic has exacerbated and probably accelerated this democratic recession. And I'm afraid these phenomena apply not only to uh, countries which are fledgling democracies, but also to some established democracies. The digital dimension is part of this story. While they were heralded as great boons for democracy when they first emerged, especially the role they played in the Arab Spring, there's been growing disillusion with social media and the impact they play in our democracies, and growing calls to try and regulate those media in our democracies. So we're here to have a very interesting discussion with some of the major players in this. Um, we have distinguished Professor Stephen Stedman, who was the Secretary General of the Kofi Annan Commission on Elections and Democracy in the Digital Age, that looked precisely at these questions and made recommendations and came out just at the beginning of the year. We have to, to address some of these points. Um, Katie Harbeth, who actually heads Facebook's attempts to try to safeguard electoral integrity at Facebook, and she'll be telling us a bit about what Facebook is doing to address these issues. And finally, a bit later in the call, we'll be joined by Daniel Brown, who works at the European Commission and is working on the European Democracy Action Plan, which is the European Union's effort to try and set about a 10-year strategy to address some of these issues to guarantee and protect the quality of European elections. Let's start with Stephen Stedman and see what are the major findings of that commission's work, which went on during a year, it was very high level, and how do you think that they apply to what we're seeing today in the US elections, Stephen? Sure. Um, so, you know, we spent about a year, year and a half researching various claims that are made about social media and democracy, but more importantly, the integrity of elections. Um, and I just want to hone in on, on, on several things. First is um, what, the, what the commission said was that um, social media is not so much a cause of uh, political polarization um, as it is um, an exacerbator. And let me just uh, uh, qualify this. What we said was that societies and polities vary in their vulnerability to disinformation and to hate speech. And if you are already polarized, if you have high uh, societal distrust and you already have pre-existing partisan media, then you're gonna be extremely vulnerable to the kind of disinformation and hate speech uh, that is so common on social media. So again, it, it's to think about social media as not, as not the cause, but as an exacerbator. Now that, that in no way lets social media off the hook. Um, uh, bad enough to say that you know, we are where we are and, and uh, we're extremely polarized to the point in the United States where uh, people are saying you know, this could be the worst election, uh, mo the, the biggest electoral crisis since 1876. Um, and so social media has to think about how, how do we reduce our role as exacerbator and actually flip it to be positive. How can we be a force for electoral integrity and not a force for uh, the destruction of electoral integrity? Um, the, second, uh, the second thing that we pointed out is that, is that we have a systemic problem. Is that we have I'm a systemic sorry, problem. I'm sorry. Um, you're... The systemic problem is sorry, that... I was gonna... uh, a good segue. The systemic segue. problem is that... Uh, Go ahead, Stephen. I, I'm, I'm getting all kinds of feedback here. So, um, the second problem is is that uh, polarization, disinformation, hate speech is not just on the platforms. The problem is on traditional media. It's on the platforms, and it's on irresponsible politicians and political parties. Um, and if you look in the United States, for instance. Um, if you just think about what is attacking the integrity of American elections, you can point to social media's role, but you also be better be pointing a finger at the President of the United States, those who are enabling him, and also uh, Fox News, quite frankly, uh, in terms of how it's covering some of these 
uh, alleged indiscretions. So it's, it is a bigger problem than social media. So that if we want to solve this, there's a, there's a number of things social media can do. Um, and I would actually give them credit. There are some things that Facebook has done in the last uh, five months to address some of these problems, but we still have a long way to go. So that the segue I wanted to use, because the tech companies are aware of how their platforms have sometimes been used and abused by various political, political actors, and they've tried to respond, and their response has been evolving over time. And maybe Katie Harbeth, who actually heads Facebook's work on trying to protect the electoral integrity uh, of elections around the world, can tell us a bit about the efforts they make and what lessons they've, they're learning right now from the US elections, because I know that every election is a chance also to learn uh, the new phenomena that are developing and how these uh, lessons might play out in the European elections, starting with German elections next year. So please, Katie. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, and thank you everyone for having me. Um, as uh, Sebastian noted, and as Professor Stedman as well, um, we're a fundamentally different company since 2016. Uh, there was a lot that we did miss in that election. And uh, election integrity has been a huge priority for the company um, in, over the last four years, and we've made a lot of um, steps, great steps forward to increase transparency um, of what's happening on the platform, particularly around political ads, uh, work um, with fact checkers and others to try to combat misinformation, a lot of really great work. Um, working in tandem with governments, other um, civil society organizations such as uh, such as the Kofi Annan Foundation, um, Atlantic Council's DFR Lab, and others um, and other um, tech companies to combat disinformation and try to combat foreign interference that we see in our elections. Um, and uh, we're also trying to do a lot of work to make sure that people are informed voters and have the right information that they need in order to vote. Um, there are a lot of steps um, in the United States that people need to go through to register to vote. And then every single state and even down to the county level um, has different processes and procedures that people need to follow. And so we are working closely with secretaries of state to make sure that people have that accurate inf information. And as you mentioned, Sebastian, we have been doing this work in elections around the world. Uh, last year, we did have, um, for instance, our political ad transparency tools were um, operational in Europe for the European Parliament um, elections. Um, and we're learning a lot from having to implement all of these efforts uh, in the field and in each election, and we are continuing to learn. And we do have a long way to go. Um, there will be no finish line in this work. Um, bad actors and adversaries will continue to try to find different ways uh, to disrupt or um, uh, hurt the integrity of elections. Um, and we need to keep getting better at trying to stop them and um, trying to combat that so we can get to a place where we are amplifying the good um, parts of what social media can do for democracy and uh, limiting the bad. Thanks, Katie. One of the changes you made recently this summer was about increasing transparency in your political advertising policy, which is actually one of the recommendations in the Kofi Annan Commission's report. Uh, Stephen, what's your assessment of the progress uh, Facebook has made over the past few years in trying to address some of the criticisms uh, you made in the report? So, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Facebook is trying to deal with this problem. I don't think if you asked anybody at Facebook, do you want to have elections that are, are rigged or are dishonest or have no integrity, nobody would say, oh yes, that's what we endorse. We, we care about elections with integrity. And there are things that they've done, um, actually they, they, a number of things that we recommended in the report, um, they've actually implemented, you know, um, and they should get credit where credit is due. Some of the things that we recommended is that uh, customers should be able to opt out of political ads if they want. So there should be an opt out for political ads. There should be a cooling off period for ads before the election. It's very important. Um, we, we strongly urged that when it came to the integrity of this election uh, in November that the plot really cooperate and work together and we're seeing action on that side. Um, we're also, you know, one of the big recommendations from the panel report is that there just has to be more data sharing with academics. Um, 
to get at some of the, the vexing problems about what is, what's really going on. Um, and, we're, and we are seeing progress on that. And then finally, um, I just saw that you know, there was a decision from uh, Facebook um, that uh, they're going to ban any political ads that call into question uh, the integrity of the election. Um, uh, which is a, you know, is a good thing, right? Um, and then finally, uh, uh, they've been very aggressive in their, their attacks and takedowns of foreign manipulation of the electoral process. All those things are good. Um, but I will say that when we issued our report back in uh, January, it seems like five years ago. <laughs> I mean, it just seems so far because of COVID. But, you know, back in January when we issued the report, it said, um, you know, we think that this election is going to be is, is going to be really bad, the election in the United States. And we taught, I think the language that we use at one point was that, a, you know, a potential sewer or something. And for my mind, it is so worse. I mean, we did not anticipate how bad uh, it was going to be, how bad the attack on the, the integrity of the election would be. So everything that Facebook do has done is all well and good. I think that there are still some problems. I think the, the first one is the sheer amount of disinformation that's, that's we, I don't know, we come up with this name, organic content. I think it's a really bad name. But the idea is that, you know, New York Times reporting yesterday uh, about the fact that um, there's so much disinformation right now about the election that is associated with mail-in ballots, the attempts to delegitimize mail-in ballots. That's the biggest piece right now in terms of disinformation uh, having to do with the election. And it's just, it's in, you, we're talking millions of posts, right? Um, uh, the, so the sheer amount of disinformation is, uh, and, and hate is, is worrying. The conspiracy stuff with QAnon, that's all worrisome. Um, Facebook knows it's out there, um, but but every time that they try to take it down, and then somebody shows up, and you know, inevitably uh, somebody from the media will say, "Well, look, you haven't taken this down," and and it just goes to the point. There's so much of it that, that that's a, that that's a real challenge. Now here's the here's the bigger one, I think, and it has to do with uh, it has to do with reality, but it also has to do with perception. We're the United States is incredibly polarized right now. We're on the knife's edge, right? And this election uh, has just profound consequences for the future of American democracy. Democracy works when everybody agrees it's an iterated game that's gonna have a long shadow of the future and we're gonna be having elections you know, every four years forever, right? And if it ever at any point comes down to the belief that election, an election is gonna be a one-time game and whoever wins is gonna rule for the next 20 years, then you're in trouble. That's where we are. So that's where we are. And there is, a, a perpetual belief that um, there is a tilt at Facebook to Donald Trump and to the Republican Party and to conservative groups and to conservative uh, uh, consumers, right? Um, and that's you know, you, you know, the question is, you know, how real is that? I think I I, I think when um, when all of their standards for takedowns devolve onto the top three or four or top one person to decide whether something should be up or not, then they've got a real problem. And it's, it's a reality problem, but it's also a perceptual problem uh, in terms of tilt. Um, and, and finally, there is the, the, the bigger question, not just about takedowns or, you know, carve outs, I mean, not takedowns, but the carve outs. Um, you know, the question is, has it become in this election uh, a much more of a right platform, right, for whatever reasons? You know, some would some some could say, well, it's an algorithm. Some say, well, it's just the natural way that, that right wing groups try to appeal to people. But again, it's perception. And, and if you come into a highly polarized environment that's at the knife's edge, um, you know, these things matter. So. Uh, thanks, Stephen. So I think what Stephen explained in the beginning, which was very interesting, was that the report found that we shouldn't be looking at uh, social media in isolation. They're part of a bigger political system, which actually breeds the problems that we're looking at. And you mentioned low trust institutions, a polarized uh, political system. Um, and this is what we're seeing in the States. Now, you've made some pretty serious uh, claims about uh, Facebook. So I thought maybe Katie should answer those questions. And maybe Katie can say a few words about the policy 
for what you remove, what you keep on, and why maybe this impression exists that the platform has a rightward tilt. Um, what's your view on that? So our goal and our work on elections um, is is really to provide the same tools and opportunities to to all political parties and everything across the political spectrum. There is um, a lot of activity that we are seeing on on both sides of the aisle on the on the platform, and I think a lot of the things that Professor Stedman um, mentioned is a lot of the reasons that we as Facebook are calling for regulation um, to help us um, help tech companies help others to be thinking about how to best solve these these problems um, around. And this is a lot of what we also submitted um, for the European, the democracy action project that the European Commission is, is putting in because we don't think that we should be making some of these decisions um, on our own as a platform and uh, would welcome regulation to that point. Uh, to your question, Sebastian, around how we handle content, um, at its most simple, we look at this in three uh, three buckets. Uh, we want to reduce, remove, and um, inform. And so if content is against our community standards, um, that will come down off the platform. Doesn't matter who you are, um, we will do that. Uh, for uh, content that is problematic, but not against our community standards, that is where um, it can be eligible uh, for fact checking potentially, um, where then um, if something is marked as false, the um, distribution of that content is dramatically reduced. And we also put a label on it that it has been marked false and give a link to the link to the fact checker. We have also been working on adding labels to content um, that is talking about voting and leading people to um, authoritative sources of information about how the voting process works. Uh, we've also been um, adding labels uh, to posts that talk about mail-in balloting to help people know that uh, doing mail-in ballots is a legitimate form um, of voting and that they have a track record of being reliable uh, as something that people can do uh, in this in this election. Um, this has been evolving incredibly fast. Uh, Professor Stedman mentioned about how um, January feels like so long ago and very different. And so we are trying to um, rapidly um, evolve um, and looking at what are the best um, the best steps to be taking and trying to combat this. And I think that it's going to be very important uh, for all of us to be continuing to have these conversations after the election and after we look at um, look at the different decisions that different tech companies made um, and what are changes that we need to be looking to be making um, to be ready for um, elections are not stopping. Um, you, like you mentioned, Sebastian, we have Germany uh, next year. 2022 will be a big year with the Philippines, uh, France, um, Kenya, I believe, has elections that year. And then 2024 is just going to be a huge year across the world in terms of elections. And so we really need to continue to work together and continue to uh, think about how to continue to improve not only our own platform, um, but the systems as a whole to make sure that we're trying to put democracy in the right direction. Thanks a lot, Katie. One of the big fears generated by the uh, American elections was going to be the scale and extent of foreign interference. And can you maybe give us already a preliminary uh, viewpoint from Facebook and the analytics you do? To what extent is that fear being uh, panning out in these elections? I mean, well, we're certainly seeing it, and we've taken down a numerous networks um, that we have seen that are trying to um, utilize our um, platform to try to sow distrust in the in the elections. Uh, we've announced quite a few of those, um, and we have a monthly transparency report um, that we put out that we put out on that uh, for that. So um, it's something that we continue to look at, and it's not just one country. We are seeing it from. From many other countries, many other countries as well. Um, and like I said, you know, the tactics are shifting, and so we have to continually um, be looking at how those uh, tactics are shifting and continuing to update our own systems to try to to try to find them. 
Yeah, and I think that um, this is a good segue because I think that the U.S. elections are such major elections and uh, there'll be so many lessons learned from that election and it'll, impl it'll have implications for elections around the world. And what I think one of the findings of the report, and here maybe Stephen can, can complement this, but one of the findings of the report is that you have some of the same actors, not just the tech companies, but other actors who are involved in election after election. So there's actually a learning curve um, all around. And so bad actors are learning just as much as, as tech companies. And so we'll constantly have to review uh, the situation uh, regularly. Stephen, how, how, um, how do you think the report is faring? You said January when this report came out was felt like a different um, age, a different epoch. But how, how do you think the report is faring in these current elections? And how relevant do you think they'll be in the, in the coming times? Which, which, which recommendations in particular do you think should be acted upon in, in the coming years? So. So I want to piggyback on something that, that Katie said uh, to make a point that we made back in, uh, in January and February. Um, Katie is absolutely right that it should be the role of governments to regulate on questions of what is a political advertisement, what is an acceptable advertisement, what, is, you know, what, what content should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed. That, that's the role of governments. Now, if you ever, you know, one lesson for the EU is if you're going to regulate, then you better regulate before polarization uh, is so high that any regulation is perceived as being a weapon to give political advantage to one side or the other. Because that's where we are in the United States. And that's, that's the bind that Facebook is in. Um, you know, there's a reason of perception right now of tilt towards Donald Trump because the Republicans, at least until, you know, for the next couple months, uh, have power, even if they lose. And then if they lose, it's going to be the Democrats. And then they're going to be under an enormous, uh, different set of pressures. Right. Um, and yes, I'm all for regulation. I think governments are, should be doing their job on this stuff, but I just want to warn you that if you try to regulate in a very polarized environment, those regulations are going to be seen through this prism of who gets advantage from it. Now, in the meantime, in the United States, there was something that we put into the report that I, I really wish would have happened. Uh, it's too late now, I think, but going forward, I think it's important in terms of political advertising. I think that the platforms have the ability to ask more of our elected officials and uh, political candidates. I think that all the, can all the platforms would be within their rights to say, um, this is our code of electoral advertising. Um, and if you want to advertise with us, then you have to agree that you are not going to use uh, fake video. You're not going to use a whole bunch of things that we decided um, are dishonest and don't have integrity. Um, and you could make that, um, you know, make political advertising dependent on whether uh, candidates live up to those, you know, those commitments. That could be something that could be done. They're completely in their right to do that. Um, it would put political actors uh, on guard that, that uh, if they want to use the platforms for advertising, then they have to meet a very, you know, an ethical, con uh, ethical standard. That's in our report. I think that's a good thing, especially, especially in countries where, again, regulation is going to be seen as a weapon of political advantage one way or the other. Right. That's not, so it's something that the platforms could do and I think would be a good thing. When you look worldwide, uh, Sebastian, um, you're absolutely right. There is a learning curve. Um, the forces of good and forces of electoral integrity are trying to learn. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, the forces of, of grifting and trying to uh, steal elections are also learning all the time. Um, and, you know, we put stuff in the report that was, you know, that was aimed at that about how do we get codes of conduct for political consu electoral consultants that go around the world and try to peddle the kinds of tactics that were used back in 2015, 14, 16, right, uh, the really bad actors. Um, and, I, and I really hope that we see some, some progress on that. Thanks, Stephen. I think this is very interesting because I think a lot of the, the public discourse now focuses on social media as being the key problem. But I think what the report does, what you're saying today, is there are many players and you're trying to 
to put responsibility where it's uh, due uh, with the political actors, the uh, political consultants, uh, the polarized media who are all part of this, of this issue. And we can't expect uh, tech companies alone to fix the fundamental issues and challenges in our democracies. Um, they, of course, have a role to play, but it's, it's going to be a much more collective effort if it's got any chance of succeeding. Um, Katie, do you feel that too, that you've been kind of uh, scapegoated uh, as kind of the, 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 the key problem when in fact you're part of a much bigger ecosystem? Do, has that been a, <clears throat> a concern of yours? Well, I think, you know, we, um, we have a lot of responsibility and we take that responsibility seriously. And we should be uh, criticized and um, held to account for the work that, that we are doing. We absolutely believe that. Um, but we also do know that like we need to wor be working uh, together across the board with uh, government, civil society, and our fellow tech companies, other media, et cetera, in trying to, trying to solve, these, solve these problems. be joined by Daniel Brown from the European Union Commission. Um, he's going to join us, I think, hopefully anytime soon. But perhaps we can already pivot uh, to the European context. You said you were very much involved in the last European parliamentary elections. What are some of the challenges you faced? What are some of the key challenges you think that European democracies face, and particularly in the digital space? One example um, that we definitely found that was a bit of a challenge was thinking about uh, both um, defining foreign interference and also our political ads platform. Uh, part of what we require for political and issue ads is that um, people get authorized and then they can only run ads to the people in that country, in the country that they are in. Um, that poses problems when you have something like the European Union uh, with many countries that are a part of it and each member state has their own laws. Uh, that they need to follow for the elections. Um, some have different rules around where they allow foreign funding to be a part of elections or not. And so we did not allow what we called cross-border advertising uh, for the most part. We did end up making some exceptions for um, pan-European organizations such as the uh, commission and political parties that were across the, the union. But I think that this is gonna be an important thing uh, for the commission and member states to consider about how do they think about that if somebody in, let's say, France is wanting to run ads into uh, Germany or any of the other um, countries, are people okay with that? Um, and can we update the rules and regulations um, to help have clear rules of the road of what is or is not allowed there? Thanks, Katie. So I'm informed that uh, Mr. Brown will be joining us actually in a few, in a few uh, seconds now. And that's a question I think we should, uh, we should ask him directly. Um, of course, the European Union is, is, a, is an organization of well, 28, soon to be 27 states uh, with different political systems. And of course, that's the perennial challenge uh, to try and come up with this. But I suppose that, that there's a mismatch because Facebook is a global platform and European citizens are using it across borders. And of course, the, each country has its own uh, regulations on democracy, uh, some being much more uh, robust than others. So that's a perennial challenge for the Commission. Uh, now, the Commission has been, as I said earlier in the, in the introduction, has been working on a uh, democracy action plan which will set its priorities for the coming 10 years. It has, will have massive institutional, regulatory, and financial implications. Um, and it began with a massive consultation of uh, citizenry, but also key players, and I think Facebook was also involved in the consultations, to try to understand what the key concerns are, uh, to make sure that the intergovernmental response is also in tune with uh, social and political concerns by citizens, but also key stakeholders in electoral processes. And Mr. Brown, in fact, has been the official working on this exact tool, um, and he said that today he would share some of the preliminary findings of the massive consultations that were done, which will come out officially towards the end of the year. And given the importance of Europe in the democratic world, I think it's going to be an important milestone, not just for Europe. Mr. Brown, thank you for joining us. It's thank you for having me. Can you me. hear me? Very sorry. I'm very sorry uh, to be late for the panel, but I was discussing European democracy with my vice president. I couldn't leave earlier. Thank you for having me. Having me. I must say that's an excellent excuse that I can't quibble with. So you've joined another conversation about democracy in Europe here. Uh, we had a few pointed questions from uh, Katie Harbeth, who's the Director of Public Policy, who works on elections at Facebook, who was 
discussing her problems dealing with cross-country political advertising and the challenges that Facebook faces in Europe regarding regulation. And earlier on, Katie had also talked about uh, Facebook's desire for clearer regulation uh, by uh, state actors in order to clarify things for her company. But perhaps you could start us off by giving us a few uh, insights into this major consultation that you've undertaken across Europe to understand the challenges uh, to democracy as seen by Europe's citizens and stakeholders, and then maybe answer some of these questions by Katie. Okay, um, so, um, I mean, maybe I start with what, uh, what the public consultation was about and why, why we launched it. Uh, so the, 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 the basic starting point is that if participation of citizens in public life is to be meaningful and effective if democracy is to be real people must be able to form their opinions free of from uh, interference where media and civil society uh, can play their part uh, and ensure checks and and balances and that was uh, where the questions were aiming at how to uphold these these values so the european democracy action plan will counter you know disinformation adapt to to evolving threats uh, and manipulations and support uh, free and independent media the public consultation ran over summer um, we uh, had uh, the, the deadline until mid september so we just uh, assessed the over 300 uh, inputs uh, uh, we're currently in the process of, you know, carefully analyzing the results uh, to ensure that all voices are heard. But I'm happy to to allude to some uh, to some preliminary findings. So first of all, for uh, uh, politicians, there seems to be strong support uh, among respondents for restrictions on micro-targeting criteria uh, for public disclosure uh, of criteria. Uh, for uh, any any profiling uh, of this sort and most respondents also agreed uh, that uh, similar rules should apply for online uh, as as they uh, as they apply offline uh, in the political context to ensure a level playing field now on on the part of the journalist i can be briefer because i understand that's not the the uh, the, the focus of this of this panel but it's certainly an area of of concern for uh, for a large majority of respondents and how to ensure the safety uh, and, and security of, of journalists. And as an example, uh, there is quite a lot of demand for us to do something against strategic lawsuits against uh, public participations, the, the so-called slaps. Um, and then more specifically on, on disinformation, um, there is significant support in favor of complementing the code of practice uh, with uh, with some form of uh, regulation or or rather enhanced you know self-regulation or co-regulation uh, and to many this is really an issue of, of uh, basic transparency and accountability of, of platforms there is uh, as an example i can give um, broad support for increased transparency with regard to uh, misleading content through labels, sharing alerts, uh, exposure notifications. Um, so in the coming weeks, we'll, we'll look at the answers in more detail to ensure, you know, that uh, that we can uh, we can have a democratic process for doing the European Democracy Action Plan. We, we have to be very uh, diligent about this. So that's uh, that's maybe for a start. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Can you say a few words about what the Democracy Action Plan aims to achieve and give us already some insights as to what the priorities might be? Okay, so uh, it should be constructed around three integrated themes. One is uh, election integrity and how to ensure that electoral systems are free and fair. The, the second area is, is, as I alluded to, strengthening freedom of expression, uh, looking specifically at uh, media freedom and media pluralism, um, as well as the role of, of civil society. And the third big pillar would be uh, 
tackling this information in a coherent manner, considering, you know, the need to look together uh, at all means used to interfere uh, in, uh, in the democratic system. So that's not only about the platforms, but also about the, the, the sources of, uh, of uh, coordinated manipulative behavior, but also about increasing the resilience of, of, the, of the targets in a way of, of the citizens. Now, I think, um, Katie, you expressed the problems that uh, tech companies like hers have when dealing with 27 or 28 different regulatory environments. I'm wondering whether the Democracy Action Plan hopes to try and come up with a common uh, European framework for this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with that. We are actually of the same opinion as uh, that a fragmented market, uh, which is currently the case, you know, hampers not only addressing uh, threats uh, that are cross-border, but also also businesses, especially SMEs. So, uh, you know, uh, uncoordinated actions by member states are not something that uh, that we like to see and, and we think, you know, fall short of effectively addressing the issues I, I mentioned on electoral interference or disinformation, which are, of course, uh, cross uh, cross-border. And if we want uh, to protect Europeans, uh, both individuals and businesses, we have to have updated and harmonized rules, which is what we're doing. Uh, we are uh, working on the Digital Services Act uh, that will, you know, look at uh, uh, accountability of the platforms as far as uh, illegal content mainly is concerned, but there will be also clear transparency provisions and the European Democracy Action Plan will also look at many actors in, in this field and, and try to provide uh, uh, a singular uh, basis for, uh, for reactions. Uh, Stephen, we have here Professor Stedman, who is the Secretary General for the, um, of the Kofi Annan Commission on Elections and Democracy in the Digital Age. Do you have any questions you want to address to Mr. Brown based on the Commission's findings and, uh, and insights? I guess just one, one question, Daniel, is uh, in, in, the, in, in this action plan, is this going to have implications for how the EU thinks about democracy assistance around the world, especially in terms of its support for uh, elections with integrity in the rest of the world? Yeah, not, not an easy question uh, because it's harder and harder to uh, delineate foreign and domestic in many of the areas uh, within the scope of the European Democracy Action Plan. But indeed, uh, the external dimension is something that, that we want to have there. Um, and I see it in, in two ways, um, in a certain sense. One is, for instance, on, on uh, election interference or disinformation, there is an external angle in that we have foreign malign actors uh, that interfere in our democracy. So, of course, we need to have a toolbox uh, and a capacity to detect and analyze what is what is happening also on, on the external front. So that's that's one part of it. The second thing is that we also need to support, for example, media in, in our neighborhood so that uh, there uh, is less uh, less space for manipulations that are done from uh, from the outside. So that is certainly something that we will want to look at. Uh, specifically on disinformation, I can refer to the 2018 Action Plan Against Disinformation, where one of the pillars uh, was uh, supporting civil society and independent journalism in, in our neighborhoods. So that's that, that's something that we're looking at, but but the scope of the European Democracy Action Plan is European democracy. But uh, as I said, and as you alluded alluded to, of course there are uh, external uh, external factors uh, affecting this. But the answer is yes. 
was yes. told that I have to bring to a close. I think that one of the key messages, though, is that um, for Europe to be able to, to export democracy has to be strong internally, and that's one of the obje objectives of the plan. Thank you very much, uh, Katie Harbeth from Facebook, uh, Daniel Brown from the European Commission, uh, Stephen Stedman from Stanford. It's been a very interesting conversation. We've seen the importance of digital for democracy. We see that just as technology keeps on evolving, our political systems also have to evolve, and it's great to see this cooperation across uh, different sectors to try to do that. As uh, Stephen Stedman saying, the forces of good are trying to push back against the forces that would weaken our democracies. It's an important fight, but I think it's one which with worth fighting. As Kofi Annan used to say, the democracy is a system most conducive to inclusive development, respect for human rights, and peace. And so it's in our, all of our interests to defend it. Thank you very much from Athens, and I wish you a pleasant evening. Good. Thank you. Thank you.